standing by. Welcome to the Obesity, Overweight, and Preconception Health Part 2 Strategies and Ideas Call. During the presentation, all the participants will be in a listen-only mode. If at any time during the conference you need to reach an operator, please press star zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded Wednesday, February 18, 2015. And I would like to turn the conference over to Megan Philippi. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's broadcast of Obesity, Overweight, and Preconception Health Part 2, Resources and Strategy for Change. The audio will be broadcasting through your computer speakers or earphones. If you are experiencing technical difficulties, please enter them into the chat box and we can assist you. Um, before we begin our presentations, I have a few housekeeping reminders. Again, audio is available through your computer speakers. We will have time for a question and answer session um, following the presentations. We invite you to submit your questions throughout the call using the chat box on the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Please send your questions to the chairperson and also be sure to include the name of the presenter or presenters to whom you are addressing your question. Today's webinar will be recorded. The recording and slides will be available on the AMCHIP website. We will also be sharing it with our partnership to distribute to their membership. Finally, you will receive an email with a short evaluation survey after the webinar ends. Please take a few moments to provide some feedback as your input is very helpful in planning future events and learning opportunities. I will now turn it over to our moderator, Sarah Verbeest, who will provide you some further housekeeping information as well as some background on today's webinar. Sarah? Thank you, Megan, and welcome, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to listen in to this webinar. It should be um, full of some excellent resources and information. Um, get to the next slide. So the purpose of our webinar today is to really focus attention on the impact of obesity on the health of young women and any future children that they may wish to have, as well as to share ideas and strategies for addressing this public health crisis among maternal and child health and chronic disease partners. The objectives of our webinar today um, are listed on the slide, and we hope that by the end of the webinar that you'll be able to describe evidence-based guidelines in managing overweight and obesity in women and men of reproductive age, describe the cultural, ethical, and social issues related to weight loss, describe some um, innovative maternal and child health approaches to healthy weight, and then describe at least five resources that are available on healthy weight and nutrition. We have a series of speakers today, and um, we'll be introducing each. I'll be introducing each of them before they begin their presentation. But I would like to thank them in advance for the time that they have invested in their presentations. Um, we really appreciate their expertise. So we will um, be starting with our first presentation on U.S. overweight and obesity. Dr. Barbara Millen is currently the president of the Boston Nutrition Foundation, and, which is an academic consulting firm through which she served as the associate editor for research of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics from 2008 through 2013, and currently does federal academic and corporate counseling in public speaking. She's also president of Millennium Nutrition, Inc., an innovative, research-driven life sciences corporation with a public health mission. Dr. Millen earned her master's and doctoral degrees in public health from the Harvard University School of Public Health. She currently chairs the 2015 U.S. Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. So, Dr. Millen, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, particularly for those kind remarks. And... Uh, uh, welcome, everybody. I'm delighted to be here um, speaking about the, um, the new um, obesity guidelines. Um, and I want to uh, start by acknowledging the many other members of the committee. And I'm delighted to be here speaking um, with them on um, all of their behalf. Um, uh, my current affiliations were noted. And again, thanks for that introduction. Um, given the diverse backgrounds of this group um, uh, in the audience, I just wanted to point out that I'm going to be focusing on the NIH, NHLBI obesity guidelines that were recently updated, but I wanted you to know 
that there are other guidelines uh, for adults as well as for children and adolescents that you may want to be aware of since this is a conference that relates to available uh, resources uh, as well. So I just wanted to include that uh, for your reference. Then to begin on overweight and obesity with some contextual backgrounds, um, to point out that overweight and obesity are, have reached epidemic proportions in our population. Uh, but this is not a new epide epidemic. The fact of the matter is that 70% uh, or more of our population, our adult population, are overweight and obese, and this has persisted for the last two decades or more in the population. And as a result of that, the uh, NIH was interested in updating its guidelines, and we recognize that new innovative approaches are needed because our current strategies have not been um, effective on a very, very broad level. We also need to understand the cost of this condition, expecting 70% of adult men and women, and the current estimated costs annually are about $114 billion and may approach as much as 10% of our U.S. health care spending. Clearly, it is something that is important for us to um, be addressing. Related to the NIH's approach uh, was the inspiration, if you will, from the Institute of Medicine, their report on the healthcare quality chasm, in which they point out that the American healthcare system is incapable of providing the public with the quality of healthcare it expects and it deserves. Because of the fact that much of the decision making is based on training and experience rather than evidence-based care with a sound scientific uh, knowledge, or that because of the approach that clinicians may oftentimes take, it varies from clinician to clinician or from place to place. So a new vision um, that is strongly evidence-based was advocated by the Institute of Medicine, and that was really part of the new strategy that the NIH took, uh, and the NHLBI in particularly, as it mounted this report. So in 20, uh, 2005, um, a large group of collaborating um, organizations were brought together as a coordinating committee to try to um, initiate the CDD um, updates um, in a variety of areas and to point out that there are actually five uh, different uh, aspects of the expert review that was going on. I'm going to be focusing on the top right on the obesity panel. But in fact, um, there were uh, a total of 16 critical questions, five of which we'll be addressing today as we look at the obesity panel um, guidelines. But to emphasize that this was a strong evidence-based report, we uh, reviewed over thousands, literally thousands, of randomized clinical trials on overweight and obesity, rated them in terms of the quality of that evidence, and then as we formulated recommendations on overweight and obesity, we rated those based on the quality of that evidence as strong recommendations, moderate recommendations, and so forth. And in the absence in certain areas of um, a, uh, a robust evidence base, we did exercise the option to use the expert opinion, and I'll make note of that um, as we go forward. Um, given that our time is quite limited, I wanted to really focus on some bottom line messages for you and answers to the five critical questions. One bottom line is that you need to understand that although this report is hundreds of pages, the chronic care model of weight management is summarized in an obesity guideline treatment algorithm. And so I'll be using this to focus um, the uh, remaining messages of my presentation. We're focusing on five critical questions in brief, the first of which is who needs to lose weight, but others in, that relate to the, how much uh, weight loss is needed to achieve health, what dietary interventions work best, what the efficacy of intervention is, and what about bariatric surgery will also be things that I'll be touching on. But first off, who needs to lose weight? Um, the first major set of messages from the guidelines are that we um, encourage providers um, professionals in the field to engage in weight management and guide their as, as a guide for their patients to better health. So weight management um, will lead to better health. Um, we're advocating screening BMI at every visit, 
to provide or refer patients for weight loss or medical nutrition therapy as appropriate if the individual's BMI is greater than or equal to 30, or if the BMI is greater than or equal to 25 and they have one or more cardiovascular risk factors, including waist circumference as one potential risk factor. When using weight circumference, the recommendation is to, for women, um, a risk is associated with 35 or more inches, for men, 40 or more inches, and then an additional recommendation to screen overweight and obese um, individuals or CVD risk factors and comorbidities because they will guide the referral process. The question uh, remains, who qualifies under these guidelines as um, BMI over 30 or BMI with uh, greater than or equal to one risk factor? You can see here, and these are taken from uh, the seventh meeting of our Dietary Guidelines Committee, that even individuals with, over, um, with uh, normal weight, that half uh, or more of them will actually present with one uh, or more cardiometabolic risk factor. You can see that this um, risk increases uh, with the, the BMI and um, is more pronounced in those uh, who are obese. And to some extent here, half of adults who are normal weight will have one, at least one cardiometabolic risk factor. Seventy percent of those who have a BMI that classifies them as overweight will have a risk factor and 75% of those who are um, obese, and that the rates of elevated blood pressure, dyslipidemia, diabetes are highest um, in those with um, elevated abdominal obesity. I also want to point out that 90% of children with type 2 diabetes are overweight or obese, and you may have, um, see these um, children in your clinics, and 93% of children with type 2 diabetes are um, following the um, adolescent uh, 12 to uh, 19 category. Um, um, Barbara, the, Barbara, this yeah, is Sarah. I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. Could you speak a little closer to oh. your mic? It's a little hard to hear you. Okay. Is that thank better? You. Sure. Thank you. Thank um, you. Why abdominal obesity um, as included in the um, risk factors? You can see here that as BMI increases, um, uh, so does waist um, to hip uh, ratio or abdominal obesity. And as both of these increase um, in parallel, the risk of coronary heart disease increases. This is a strong evidence base, and therefore abdominal obesity was one of the risk factors we included in the guidelines. Okay, moving on to the second question, how much weight loss is needed? What are you telling your clients and your patients in terms of how much weight loss is needed to achieve the health benefits. Bottom line here is that even a modest weight loss of 2 to 5 percent has major clinically um, related health benefits. A goal, of course, would be for 10 percent, and that's certainly manageable and achievable in terms of what the evidence tells us, but even at levels of 2 to 5 percent, you can see uh, important uh, improvements from in the cardiometabolic risk factors. Refer patients for nutrition counseling, um, or comprehensive intervention conducted by trained professionals and intensify the approaches if needed by the individual. You can see here, and this is just one of the evidence bases that we looked at, and this is the look-ahead trial, one-year data, that even at levels of 2 to 5 percent um, uh, looking across the uh, x-axis here, that there are significant improvements in blood pressure, triglyceride, and uh, uh, LDL cholesterol levels with even the modest level of weight loss. And this is really encouraging news um, for patients. It makes a difference even at 2 to 5%. Okay, third question, what dietary interventions work best for weight loss? And are weight loss methods as effective for CBD risk reduction? Um, okay, here, uh, bottom line is that there are many options that exist for weight loss as long as a calorie deficit is achieved. Therefore, one size um, uh, fitting all is no longer necessary. There are many options as long as a caloric deficit is, achie is achieved. Another key message is to personalize the diet based on the individual's health risk, lifestyle behavioral profile, and personal needs and preferences. This is personalized medicine without the G. 
for genetics, personalized medicine focusing on lifestyle, that is those things that the individual can um, have some impact on and that you can work with your clients um, to achieve. Um, and um, also here, refer to medical nutrition therapy if risk profile warrants. So although diets with a caloric deficit, many of them will work for effective weight loss uh, therapy, if a um, individual's profile is complicated by multiple risk factors, then a more t uh, targeted medical nutrition therapy may be warranted. So to point out here that the recommendation, and this is a strong run, sound evidence-based, very strong recommendation, you can use the following approaches to achieve that caloric deficit, 12 to 1,500 calories for women, 15 to 18 for men, or a strategy where you reduce 500 to 750 calories per day to achieve a one to two pound weight loss a week and to prescribe one of the evidence-based diets that restricts certain types of foods or food groups, um, which has been demonstrated in the literature to be effective. And the really interesting and great news, I think, is that 17 diets have actually borne the peer review process and have been demonstrated as effective in the literature. And the next three slides just summarize what they are. They're targeted macronutrient diets, Mediterranean diets, the American Heart Association diet, the diabetes guideline diet, high protein, lacto ovo vegetarian, low calorie energy uh, restriction, carbohydrate modifications, fat modifi modified mm -hmm. diets, low glycemic index diets, and uh, uh, moderately low fat and low fat diets. Again, all with caloric restriction. And the point is summarized here from the pounds lost um, trial and the references there is that if you go head to head with any one of these diets, they perform equally well as long as the caloric deficit is achieved. So caloric deficit is key in weight loss. And the good news in all of this is that of these um, uh, 16 um, dietary interventions that are reported on the literature. Any one of these options is, sorry, uh, sorry, 17 diets. Any one of these options is perfectly suitable for you to discuss as an option um, with the clients that you're working with, as long, again, as the caloric deficit is achieved. Now, a, a related question that I wanted to take just a second to talk about is why should dietary and lifestyle interventions be personalized? Why is this such a strong message in the obesity guidelines? Well, first off, if we look at who is most successful, it's those who, who adhere to the diets. And we know that in order to improve adherence, we try to tailor the diets to the preferences and the needs of the individual. And that is one of the bases for trying to personalize intervention. Then if we look at literature on men and women, and these are data taken from uh, my research at the Framingham Heart Study, we see that the experience with weight loss is not the same in adult men and adult women. In fact, women start a little bit later um, in their late teens to add weight. But as you can see here, their weight, weight gain uh, accelerates beyond that seen in men, and women continue to gain weight in their adult life 10 years beyond men into their 70s and beyond, which is really, you know, a, a sort of a shocking um, uh, thing to understand. And again, early intervention is important, and, um, it, and these data underscore the importance of tailoring to the unique needs of men and women and their own individual experiences with weight gain. We see here um, also that uh, the, um, uh, in summary, that women can expect to gain 18 pounds, men can expect to gain 14 pounds, and women can expect in the far right to result or to experience much more abdominal obesity. 70% of adult women will experience, on average, abdominal obesity compared to just a little over a half of men. And we know that this is the most metabolically active uh, form and a risk factor that is one of the factors to guide um, the um, uh, uh, referral uh, for weight management and overweight and um, 
uh, uh, and obese men and women. Bottom line, men and women don't have the same experiences. It's another reason to personalize. And beyond that, if you look at their dietary patterns, you discover that men and women, not surprisingly, don't eat exactly the same way. In fact, if you look at habitual eating practices, again, mm -hmm. within our Framingham data, there are 10 different dietary patterns that men and women exhibit. They don't overlap much except for a high, um, uh, what we call an empty calorie pattern, high in calories, high in fat, low in micronutrients, not a terribly nutrient-dense diet. Um, but the point being that there are different um, habitual frameworks that men and women begin a dieting experience with, and we have to understand that if we're going to personalize and tailor the interventions to their needs. So um, moving on, uh, in the interest of time, what's the efficacy and effectiveness of comprehensive lifestyle intervention? Do the data support comprehensive lifestyle intervention, and what kinds of techniques work the best? Bottom line here with a strong recommendation is that those who need to lose weight should receive comprehensive um, uh, programs, preferably one that includes diet, physical activity, and behavior modification of six months or longer, preferably a year or longer, with at least 14 sessions in the six-month period conducted in a group or individually by a trained team or a skilled interventionist like a registered dietitian. Other approaches like web-based um, uh, or telephonic interventions are helpful to enhance treatment, but they are not standalones. The literature does not yet support that. Apps are not a, an intervention of themselves. The web apps that are so popular, they may um, help motivate people, but what really the bottom line tells us is that one-on-one -on -one or group counseling by trained um, professionals is really what's effective. And you can see here that it not only uh, in the blue bars results in greater levels of weight loss um, at 8% um, or more versus under 1%, and those who are most effective are also those who are involved in intensive lifestyle interventions. So a couple of other messages. Um, for those who struggle, intensification may be needed in the intervention. Medications under medical supervision might be considered. This was based on expert opinion since it wasn't a tremendous focus of our work, but we wanted to mention the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, that the potential effectiveness of medications as an adjunct to treatment. Then to point out just uh, for a minute or so on bariatric surgery, this is really an area only for patients um, in the extreme mm -hmm. with BMIs over uh, 35 or, or more um, or over 40. And again, under medical supervision, there are at least three different approaches um, that are noted here, but I also want to underscore that these are not risk-free, therefore are to be used only in rare cases, if you will, and with strong medical supervision, um, typically with um, support by um, uh, a comprehensive lifestyle team um, uh, as well, and again, something to be used in rare circumstances. Here we've got a comparison of the approaches that I've talked about. Lifestyle uh, is effective certainly up, in, up to around 10% weight loss. We know that that's achievable. The literature supports that. 2 to 5% is clinically meaningful. We can enhance slightly if we add medication and um, surgery uh, in the more advanced uh, or extreme cases mm -hmm. is certainly um, effective, but um, uh, again, is associated with considerable risk, so we don't uh, use that um, without that understanding. Um, overall, weight loss improves health, effective treatments are available. We've got 17 different options in terms of effective weight loss um, regimens that have been published in the literature as long, again, equally successful as long as caloric deficit is achieved. Um, with complicated cases with multiple risk factors, you do want to consider um, tailoring the diet more specifically and consider medical nutrition therapy. 
um, if we're going to really turn the corner, if you will, on the obesity epidemic, we really have to start thinking innovatively. We need to use the strong evidence base. We need to shift the paradigm, if you will, in public health and health care towards greater focus on prevention. Mm -hmm. And um, that will entail public-private partnerships and a lot of leadership, hopefully, from those you know, who are participating um, today in this conference and personalizing lifestyle management um, and intervention. Now, in the remaining uh, few minutes uh, that, uh, that I've got uh, left, what I want to do is also talk to you a little bit about one type of resource, and I know you'll hear about others, but this is work that we've been conducting, uh, funded um, uh, with seed funding by the, the university, Boston University, electronic platforms to inspire prevention um, uh, in clinicians, patients, and consumers, including uh, overweight and obesity, but also a major chronic uh, conditions that are so costly and devastating in our population. What's available online are lifestyle and health risk assessments that focus on personal characteristics, anthropometry, uh, nutrition, and other aspects of lifestyle, again, that we know that you can help your clients and your patients do something about. The result of those surveys is a personalized lifestyle profile that can help target and uh, personalize that uh, intervention, pointing out where the individual may want to focus in terms of goal setting uh, and intervention strategies. Um, it looks at not simply um, diet and physical activity, but also alcohol and uh, smoking. It looks at not only dietary patterns, but uh, looks at diet in relationship to the guidelines from the um, uh, dietary guidelines uh, for healthy eating and also looks at um, nutrient quality and micronutrient density in the diet in a way that um, we think is uh, really um, helpful for the consumer but also easy for the professional to work with. There are guidelines for um, evidence-based weight loss plans at different calorie levels that are exhibited here and, and a, an abundant um, number of online resources to help um, the individual and the clinician, including a diet and exercise tracker that can either be done online or with mobile tracking uh, devices using the soundest of the um, uh, nutrient um, uh, databases. Um, it's complete, there's no missing data, um, and it's one of the, the um, most robust of the uh, government uh, resources. The online also allows personal dashboards for each uh, individual client to be set up, and it creates an online reward system as progress is achieved, and so um, hope and that's seen as motivating of the individual's experience. And over time, as the profile surveys are um, uh, completed over time, you can actually uh, use the system to um, make progress reports and to communicate um, between client and uh, professional on uh, progress that's, that's being made. Um, so um, just to conclude, um, remember that weight loss does improve health and that it's important and that we need to focus with personalized and innovative approaches that we'll talk more about in this session in order to achieve success. Um, we've got a lot of effective tools to work with. Um, targeting and personalization is key. And if we're going to be effective in translating these guidelines into practice, we need to continue training such as this. We need to shift the paradigm with greater focus, not on advanced treatment, but on prevention. Um, we need to work together on providing incentives not only for patients, but also for clinicians to work towards prevention and um, to work towards reimbursement of weight management. Uh, we need to work on public-private partnerships that really can help create cultures of health and to facilitate weight management in community and work site and school-based settings. We need to inspire mm -hmm. through those things, public um, uh, uh, 
the public and to inspire our leadership. And I hope um, that there are many of you who are on this uh, webinar who are in such positions to really move this forward and to take advantage of the new guidelines and the resources that are available. And again, please uh, you know, let me end with a, a, um, to underscore the importance of personalization and lifestyle management for overweight and obesity. And know that um, this report um, does uh, pull together a, an abundance of information to really support you in what you're doing. And with that, um, I will turn it over um, to our um, administrators, but I certainly encourage your questions and those of you who would be interested in collaborating, uh, you have my contact information and I'd be delighted uh, mm -hmm. to work with you as I am with other clinicians and work sites and um, uh, healthcare systems um, on this uh, uh, area. Many thanks. Thank you. That was great. Really, also interesting, the slides about the differences between men and women. That explains a lot about my husband and I. Um, so oh. Really, <laughs> really informative. Thank you. Um, before we move on, um, I just have um, – we, there are some, some questions coming up in chat that we'll talk about later, but one of them I just is kind of a clarifying question um, for you, Barbara, which is the, the health main resource that you shared. Is that cost money for users or is that a free resource? It looks fantastic, and I think people are curious about how they might be able to access that. Yes. So the, one of the things that was mentioned, my, the um, business that we set up, again, with deep funding from the university, um, we are conducting translational resource, uh, research. And um, the, there are two web links, myhealthmain.com and healthmain.com. In My Health Maine, um, there is a free um, assessment tool that exists so that virtually anybody um, in this moment can go online and get a, an assessment of their BMI um, can, and can get a, uh, based upon their estimated calorie needs, can get a guideline for healthy eating. That is absolutely free and I'd like as many people to, um, you know, to be aware of that resource as possible. It was mentioned that we have a public health mission, and basically, for the cost of a copay, um, a an institution, a small private practice, could make this available um, to their clients at cost of a copay per year. So the cost of basically building this web link into your system would be about um, ten to fifteen dollars per patient per year not per month, um, um, as many of the um, subscriptions that are available. It's really, on that basis, um, no more than the cost of an mm -hmm. app. But this is totally evidence-based, and I would point out to mm -hmm. the clinicians um, and those in public health or health systems that this is also a web resource that is, number one, HIPAA compliant, so that the privacy of the individual is protected, and number two, there are analytics that are available to allow us to report back to the health system on the quality of the care that you're providing and aggregate information on weight loss and improvements uh, in patients that or the clients that you uh, serve. So um, there's one part that is absolutely um, free and the rest is very nominally um, uh, uh, Cost so that the platform and its future development can be supported. Um, but it's, it is uh, basically um, at the level of um, the app as you look um, over the course of a year. I hope that's helpful. Great. Oh, that's, thank you very much. I think there may be some other questions and we'll get to those at the end, but that's really helpful. And I think um, I, I put the um, myhealthmain.com in the chat, and then also we, you saw Dr. Um, Millen's um, email. 
and we'll have even more we'll have more resources at the end of the webinar as well. So um, thank moving, thank you again. Um, so moving to our next speaker, I'm excited to introduce to you Dr. Julie Metos. She is the chairperson of the Division of Nutrition at the University of Utah. Prior to joining the faculty in the Division of Nutrition, Dr. Metos led the clinical dietetics department at Primary Children's Hospital. She is a state and national leader in pediatric obesity prevention in schools and the community. Her research focuses broadly on women's and children's nutrition. Most recently, her work examines the influence of school nutrition and physical education policies on adolescent obesity using population data from the Utah Population Database. Uh, Dr. Metos and her faculty members in the Division of Nutrition are currently providing education, collaboration, and technical assistance to the campus community on the future of personalized nutrition in research, clinical care, and public health. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Metos. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And thank you to Dr. Millen for her nice presentation and her work on the National Obesity Guidelines. It's very good information for all of us. I'm also really looking forward to hearing about a wonderful program in Alameda County, a community program that can serve as a great national research source. My task um, right now is to drill down on how to discuss obesity and health, either one-on-one -on -one or in groups. When I work with people and clinicians across our region, I'll go through my whole presentation. I think I'm being very practical and pragmatic in talking about the National Obesity Guidelines and about what we can do in our clinics and with our patients. And at the end of the presentation, somebody always raises their hand and says, yes, but how do we talk about obesity? How do we bring it up with our clients? So I think even though we've had at least one to two decades of talking about overweight and obesity in our health professions, sometimes we still, still feel a little hesitant to bring it up with an individual. So today, um, coming here from the University of Utah, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how you can bring it up with individuals and why that's important. I'll also talk a little bit about anticipatory guidance because we know that when women are pregnant and when men and women are starting families, we can also work with them on setting healthy habits for themselves that they can share with their families as they become parents. So today I'll be talking about why is it difficult to talk about weight, how you can make it easier. We'll talk a little bit about guiding versus directing conversation. Many of you might be familiar with this, but it's a helpful um, way of thinking about how bringing up, how to bring up obesity. We'll talk about potential topics for discussion when a client shows interest. And then, as I mentioned, we'll talk about these going forward into parenthood. So we all know that talking about overweight and obesity can be difficult, and this comes primarily from social pressures, cultural norms, guilt, shame, and blame, and negative language and labels that we use when we talk about overweight and obesity. For example, as far as cultural norms, many different cultures have different ways of thinking about weight. In our community here in Utah, we have a very large Pacific Islander community. We have a Tongan community that is the largest in the United States, and many of those clients tell us that they feel like weight shows power, it shows affluence, they feel proud of their weight and their size. So we have to have different strategies for different communities. We also know that as our culture has increased their weight and their size, sometimes when we look around at the people we work with or the people that we um, are professionals with, all of our weights might be increasing and so it feels more normal to us and that can be a barrier. Some of the language that we use, even as health professionals, sometimes is counterproductive. For example, couch potatoes, people feeling being lazy, people should just do it. Those kinds of things are prevalent in our society and can be a barrier. Then as clinicians, sometimes we observe that patients don't have motivation, they're not adhering to our recommendations. This could be a real or perception that we may have. Sometimes we feel like there's a perceived lack of effective therapy. As we heard in the last presentation, there's many different styles of diets and lifestyle counseling that can be effective, 
but there is a perception sometimes among clinicians that really nothing works, and so we don't feel very effective in, or in what we might be able to share with clients. And also we might not feel effective or feel like we have self-efficacy in our counseling skills. Finally, as I mentioned, oftentimes clinicians, or in my case when I'm working in schools, oftentimes teachers are overweight. When I work with our legislators, sometimes they're overweight or obese. So we feel kind of defensive or we may feel hesitant to talk about it because we're not a model of perfection. Some of the tips that we've used in our healthcare system are in to encourage clinicians to talk about their tips, their struggles, and their strategies that they use when they talk to patients so that they can develop a rapport and talking about how in our current environment all of us have to be working on these issues and that it's a challenging thing for all of us and kind of a tone that we're in it together. We do know that it's important to talk about weight and lifestyle with our patients, and it probably is important to do so almost every time that we see them. And I think Dr. Millen's presentation talked quite a bit about the health outcomes that we see with just modest amounts of weight loss. So we need to overcome um, our feeling or our client's feeling that we need to have a before and after picture or have perfect success or have it be something similar to what we see on television. Clients definitely respond to clinicians addressing their weight and lifestyle habits, and the research suggests that if weight and lifestyle are not mentioned in regular visits, clients decide that it must not be important to their health. So how can you make it easier? These are common sense bullets here, but I wanted to give you time to think about them. It's important to be empathetic, it's important to be non-judgmental. This involves willingness to suspend an authoritative role and do about 50% of your time as a listener, showing genuine interest in the client. It's a collaborative process, not prescriptive. Focus on the client's capacity. Oftentimes, we have many barriers that we identify in our client's capacity, barriers as far as budget, foods that they might be able to afford, their time or resource in getting physical activity, their ability to comprehend what we're talking about, and um, other barriers and resistance that they might have with other diseases that they're addressing or um, their lifestyle in terms of time management or managing many different tasks of daily living. It's really important to talk about habits, not just weight. When we talk about eating habits and physical activity habits, we're talking about the how instead of the why. This is a very key um, point is that we really want to tell people how to do these things, not just why. When we talk about why, it tends to be perceived more as nagging. So we want to give very prescriptive and personalized messages for individuals. And I already talked a little bit about how you can personalize it and develop rapport by talking about your own strategies and your own struggles. Pascal said that we are usually convinced more easily by reasons we have found ourselves than by those we have, that have occurred to others. So our key strategy here is to get other people to bring up what will work the best for them instead of us telling them. So it's a little different kind of discussion. We call this directing versus guiding discussion. Here on this slide is a little clip of a discussion that I saw one day. And the clinician was basically relaying information about glucose and about weight and said that your test results shows the levels of glucose in your blood are raised today and your weight gain is faster than I would like to see. This means you really need to watch your diet and get some more physical activity. I should mention this was done in a very empathetic and kind voice. And the patient says, I have tried, but you know what it's like. It's not so easy with a job and kids, and you're always rushing and have to grab food at lunch and keep going. The clinician said, well, you could bring a sandwich from home, patient. I could, but it's so busy in the morning. Well, you could make it the night before. 
well, I'm so tired in the evenings, I'm not sure I would do that. Finally, the clinician said, well, my advice to you is to treat this as your top priority. Here we have an empathetic discussion that was more in the a style of directing. Here the clinician also got kind of stuck in the but, but, if but kind of um, trap. So every time they made a suggestion, the patient said, yes, but, yes, but. And so here this was a discussion that wasn't quite as effective as the next one, which is a guiding discussion. Here the clinician starts the discussion by asking a question. Your test result is high today and your weight is increasing. I wonder what sense you make of this. Patient, I don't know. It's hard enough getting by day to day without having to worry about this too. I know I should do better. Clinician, in what way? Here the clinician's trying to get the patient to give some ideas about what they could do. I need to eat better and get more exercise, but it's not so easy. What might be more manageable for you now? Well, it's got to be watching portions, but I don't expect a lot. Well, watching portions will be a great help. I am confident that if you choose to watch your portions, you will find a way to make it happen. Here the clinician is letting the patient identify some strategies and then confirming and showing confidence in the patient's decision. Even if the discussion doesn't go any further than this, this type of strategy is showed to help the patient think about it later and develop some of their own skills. This is a way we talk about motivational interviewing or a skill of motivational interviewing. In this discussion, we didn't see any change language exactly, and so the clinician can just stop right there. If the patient displayed any change language, like I'm ready to, I'm willing to, I've started to, the clinician can ask for permission to share some information with them. They can share some how information. Some of the literature suggests that it's important to share this verbally rather than overwhelming people with handouts, allow them to come up with the ideas, and then show confidence. And this strategy does require follow-up with the patient, either through a multidisciplinary program or with a dietitian, or again with the clinician that they're seeing at this visit. So for example, if you're working with a patient that has gestational diabetes, these are some of the usual standard recommendations about diet. Certain recommendations about carbohydrate, about protein, fruits and vegetables, decreasing sweets, and a prenatal vitamin. Pretty common standard dietary information, but we always encourage our clinicians to kind of get in the shoes of individuals with um, a certain condition or disease, and what we find with our diabetic, gestational diabetic patients is a lot of times they tell us that they've been thinking, I can eat any type of food while I'm pregnant, I can eat a lot of quantity, I need calories, it's the only time I'm allowed to be fat, or I'm too tired for exercise while pregnant. And the new thoughts that we want to relay to them, that they, we want them to have in their own mind, is that the types and quantities of food they choose are important, they need to limit certain foods and calories, counts, and that their diet needs to have some structure, and that their health will benefit from regular activity. And so if we do hear that change language, we can go into some ideas with them to discuss, or again, if you hear them talk a little bit about it, to go into more detail. We often have drilled it down to very specific topics that they um, that people have told us in the past were very helpful. One of those is support from family and friends to talk a little bit about daily eating habits, specific tips on what to have with you at work, how to schedule your meals and snacks, specific dialogues, even role-playing of how to resist treats or changing your environment so that they're not tempting to you, talking a little bit about emotional eating and exercise avoidance, we usually talk quite a little bit about stress, positive self-talk, and walking for transportation is one of our most successful tips that we've given to our clients. We talk quite a bit about protein sources, tips for eating more fruits and vegetables. Um, many of our clients are working on a very limited budget, so we talk about specific low-fat milk, yogurt, peanut butter, um, 
sources, where they can get those sources, where we know which grocery stores have them for the lowest cost. We talk, spend some time talking about frozen vegetables, in-season produce, and um, different ways that people can keep track of their eating and physical activity. The way that works the best for our clients is by paper, but there's also, of course, technological um, tools that can be used. In our tips, we usually talk about a fitness activity for life. We have prescription pads that we use to help people find community centers that are very low cost in their community, how to find parks, um, weight exercise videos, dancing in the living room, um, education on restaurant eating. You can see that we really spend a lot of time drilling down with people very specific strategies that can help with eating and physical activity. The last thing that we spend some time with that's a little bit unique when working with this population is we talk a little bit about obesity prevention in early life. We found it to be very motivating to people to work on their own diet and um, physical activity when they know that they're going to be parents. And so we can talk about very standard types of tips for infants, um, really common tips that are discussed in women, infants, and children shown here about breastfeeding. One that's been really successful or for us is to have information about increasing movement opportunities for infants, putting them down on a blanket instead of in a car seat. Very basic information about increasing movement from the very beginning of life. We talk a lot about toddlers and again some very basic information about getting toddlers involved in healthy eating and physical activity. We've spent quite a lot of work um, sh showing parents how to choose daycare, daycares and um, care settings that have good eating, feeding, and activity patterns and quality. And we do spend a lot of time helping women schedule meals and snacks for themselves when they're pregnant. and showing them how they can carry that over when they have toddlers. Many of our clients are very interested in ways that they can help their children. Many of our clients have been overweight or obese their whole life, and they would like to know how to prevent that for their children. And so we have kind of a menu of tips that we go over with them about young elementary children listed here. And we do spend time. Um, a little bit of time on family meal time. So I just wanted to summarize by saying it's really important for everyone in the medical field to talk about weight and obesity to feel comfortable doing so, to talk about lifestyle habits and not just weight, use soft directing and guiding language, and to look for change language before going into a laundry list of suggestions, asking permission to share information, sharing a nugget of information based on what you've heard them talk about, and then be able to follow up and refer according to the National Obesity Guidelines. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your attention, and I'm always happy to talk about this topic with you at a later date or during questions. Thank you. Thank you. That was really comprehensive um, and well said. <laughs> so thank you again very much. Um, so transitioning to our next speaker, we told you we have a lot to cover in our webinar. So we're moving now to um, talking about working with women, families, and communities to achieve healthy weight. So I'm really excited to introduce my friend Kiko Mallon. She is the Family Health Services Division Director for the Alameda County Public Health Department in Oakland, California. She's responsible for oversight of perinatal and early childhood home visiting programs services for children with special health care needs, and the building blocks for health equity unit, whose goal is to achieve health equity through innovative multi-sector work with women, children, families, and communities. She holds master's degrees in public health and social work from UC Berkeley. So Kiko, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Sarah, and thanks to all of you for attending the webinar. Um, I'm also really grateful to Drs. Millen and Natos for their excellent presentations, which I think have really perfectly set the stage for what I'm going to talk about, which is how we can work closely with women, families, and communities to achieve healthy weight. So I'm going to talk about some more community-based strategies. 
The first thing I'm going to talk about is our Healthy Start initiative in Alameda County, which we've had for a long time since the very beginning, since 1991. And it's evolved over the years, but its focus right now is on African-American families in the neighborhoods with the highest infant mortality rates. And the goal of the program, as probably many of you know, is to reduce infant mortality, reduce disparities in perinatal outcomes, improve birth outcomes such as low birth weight and preterm birth. And in Alameda County, we look specifically at how we can work really closely with this population to empower participants to adopt healthy lifestyles and how can we also address the underlining, so underlining psychosocial factors that have such a huge influence on health in general and specifically on perinatal health. We work primarily in, in as I mentioned, with the African American community, low-income communities of color, and I think probably many people on the phone are familiar with a lot of, with the social context in which folks in those communities are living. Um, many of our clients are facing things like poverty and income instability, um, very expensive housing, exposure to violence both in the home and in the streets, under-resourced schools, lack of access to healthy foods, many of them live in food deserts, and it's important for us to recognize this context and these challenges that our families face when we're doing work with them in general and specifically around um, achieving healthy weight. But it's also important to recognize that these participants um, in our program also have a lot of strengths and it's important to help them to recognize their strengths and to build on those strengths in any kind of intervention that we do. Many of the women that we work with are incredibly resilient. They've had very difficult lives and they, they keep on keeping on. They are able to handle setbacks and just persevere through even the toughest of situations. Um, they have, they're often very um, enterprising. They have a forgiving spirit. And, and overall, even though it might not seem like it, they really do value their children's education and they want the best for their kids. Um, I think sometimes it comes out in ways that we might not recognize that that's what's going on, but if we really think about it and have deep conversations with our clients about their lives and what they want for themselves and their children, we, we realize that that is really what, that, that is what motivates them. And, but, and capitalizing on that is an important piece of helping women to take care of themselves, is to frame it in terms of being there for their children. If you don't take care of yourself, you can't really be there to take care of your kids. We, as I said, we've had the program for a number of years now and it's gone through many iterations and along the way we always take time to check in with our consumers and do needs assessment and figure out are we really meeting the needs of our community. Um, and in the last maybe five or six years our, recent, our needs assessment findings were telling us that we needed to build in more robust programming during the interconception period because women would fade away. They were with us during the pregnancy, we were focusing on having a healthy baby, and then the, when the baby was born and the intervention sort of tended towards focusing exclusively on the infant, the women were not as interested because there wasn't as much in, them, in it for themselves. Um, or they were interested, but there just wasn't a focus on them. It was all about the baby. And so we really wanted to um, think about how we could focus more on women and how they could be, be, take care of themselves in order to take care of their families. And any kind of talk that we had that was really specifically about how do you, you know, what do you need to do in order to have a healthy baby just became very limiting. And I think this is what we're thinking about in general with preconception and interconception health is how do we focus on women? How do we talk about the impact of women's health and healthy weight in particular on, you know, the, any pregnancy that that woman might have, but how do we also frame it for how it has an impact on her own health and her own well-being? The other thing that we heard loud and clear from our consumers about what they needed from us in terms of programming is um, programming that was implemented in a way that was non-stigmatizing. You know, we used to put out flyers that would say, come to a birth control workshop, sounds controlling. Come to a depression support group, sounds depressing. Instead, let's frame it in a way that really makes women feel like this is a place where I can come and get support and talk about some things that might be difficult, but do it in a way that's gonna be helpful to me and isn't gonna make me feel bad. So as a result of that, we came up with our club mom, which we think about as a health education home as opposed to a medical home for young African American women. So what are the principles of club mom? Um, pr first of all, we hold their, their group sessions with women. Um, we hold them in neutral neighborhood locations near public trans transportation hubs, recognizing that a lot of folks really need to use the bus to get around. Um, we recruit and train peer health leaders from the community to work as co-facilitators, and we provide them with a $50 grocery gift card for that work every month. 
And we also provide highly desired participant incentives at every session, like grocery gift cards. We raffle prizes off. Sometimes we have really good things like a car seat, depending on what we can scrounge, bus tickets, that sort of thing. Um, and what we, what's really um, most important about this is setting a, a tone in the group where the women themselves are really coming to the group talking about what they want to talk about within, you know, really, so that it's really relevant to them and that it's a conversation that's guided by a facilitator but where the women really have control over what's talked about within certain um, constraints, which I'll mention in the next slide. So this is what our promotional material looks like. Um, the top one is called Keeping It Moving, so that's our healthy eating, active living kind of tagline. Again, not like, come learn how to eat better. It doesn't sound so exciting to people, but keeping it moving sounds fun. Um, sex, let's talk about it. That's our club mom that's about relationships. And My Life, Our Story is about mental health and wellness and uh, giving women an opportunity to just talk about what's going on in their lives and the hardships that they may have faced and the successes that they may have had in overcoming those hardships. So in building this health education home, as I mentioned, it's really group driven and the women help to set um, the tone and often give us ideas for what particular topics they'd like to hear about. But we have three monthly rotating themes, mental health relationships and healthy eating, active living. Um, we have a licensed MFT in addition to an MPH level perinatal health educator who helps to lead the groups. And we also do invite guest speakers, often with input from the women in the groups that can provide additional support and information. And of course, we always provide childcare, which is critical. And the way we think about Club Mom, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that the social context and the environmental context in which a lot of these women are living is really heavy, and it, makes, it has an impact on decisions that are made and, and on behavior. And so the idea between, behind Club Mom is to bring people together to give them information, but also to positively change in some way it's a, it's a tall order, and it doesn't just happen in the group, but to try to positively change the context in which young African-American mothers make decisions about their health. Um, and we want to create an environment of social support where we can give health information, um, where women also get knowledge about resources, but where we help to work on motivational behaviors like the kinds of things that Dr. Metos was talking about in her, in her talk. And I apologize, the slides are a little bit cut off here, I think the formatting got messed up when I emailed it to Megan, but I'll fix it so that if you do down download the slides later, you won't, it won't be cut off and you'll be able to see the whole thing. Um, so just to give you a little bit of an idea of what we look at in healthy eating, active living within Club Mom, and we do go through some of the tried and true sorts of health education things like My Plate. We have a campaign here at the County Health Department called Rethink Your Drink, which is very visual. You have lots of different bottles of different kinds of drinks with then you know, the pile of sugar that's in each of those drinks, so it really helps women to understand just how much sugar is in that large, that big gulp soda that they might be drinking. Um, we do the same thing with sodium. What's in your bag is about um, you know, what you're buying at the store and how to plan your meals, and being sugar savvy is, again, about sugar content in foods. But in addition to that, the healthy eating, active living groups, which are, we, we're really fortunate to have a professional chef on staff. She's one of our outreach workers, so she does a fantastic job um, helping women to really understand how to cook foods well and to address the issues that might come up for them in terms of barriers to being able to eat healthy that are not just about access to food, but are things about women, really sometimes kids who grow up in foster care, they have very little autonomy over what they eat or have had very little experience even how to turn on an oven, um, how to store things, may not even be knowledgeable about you know, what needs to go in the fridge, what doesn't. Um, buying produce and then finding that it goes bad really quickly is an incredible disincentive because as we all know, produce is a little expensive. So if you spend a bunch of money on it and then it goes bad in a couple of days because you didn't eat it up, you didn't realize how long it was going to last or you didn't store it properly, that doesn't exactly serve as an incentive for you to continue buying fresh produce. Um, so that's stuff that we talk about, um, how to set up a well-functioning kitchen within the constraints that you may have. Some of the women that we work with are, you know, sharing a home with someone that may not even be a relative, maybe they're couch surfing, they don't have access to a kitchen, some of our women are homeless. All of these kinds of things you need to work around and really understand where is that woman coming from and how can you help her, as, as Dr. Julie Meadows said, come up with something that's manageable and reasonable for her, setting expectations that will work. And using the group to talk about this stuff and for people to share their own stories and how they've succeeded in overcoming some of these barriers is what really helps women to make behavior change. Um, dealing with family dynamics and legacies around food, including trauma and scarcity, we've really adopted, adopted a trauma-informed approach to all of our work 
in the health department and it's certainly relevant when it comes to issues of health, uh, of eating and nutrition. And that's a whole other presentation that I don't have time to go into today. Um, but also the health benefits of drinking water, which is that some people just don't realize how, much, how many calories and how much sugar is in soda. In fact, one of our participants specifically thanked Club Mom staff for helping her to lose 32 pounds. And that was prime for her, it was about understanding um, the difference between never having drunk water much. It's not a habit that she had. And indeed, it's not a habit for many of the women that we work with. It's sort of a norm to drink soda. And so Club Mom, where we always serve spa water, water with cucumbers or lemon or orange in it, and get the women used to drinking that, talking about how much sugar is in soda, it's affected a norm change for that group which in turn has helped those women to carry that norm change over into their lives. Other evaluation findings are that trust in relationships must be established and developed before health behavior change can really be realized by many of these women. And, and that's what happens in the group. It's trust and relationship and behavior change, um, relationship development and behavior change flows from that. And also life, school, life skills, opportunities, and resources must be enhanced so that young, low-income African-American women can make optimal health-related decisions. So that's um, Club Mom. I'm just going to briefly show you a couple slides about Choose Health LA Moms, which is in Los Angeles, not a program that I run, um, but it is, it's about reducing obesity among postpartum women in Los Angeles County. Uh, they have um, three primary interventions, three simple messages that they focus on, which I think is great because a lot of times it can be really overwhelming for people. So those messages are breastfeeding, active activity, so 10,000 steps, and water. Um, and they enroll women or begin to look at women, enrolling women in the program when they, if they are pregnant and obese at about 37 weeks gestation, so just prior to delivery. The strategy is to use partners such as clinics and hospitals to recruit potential participants. Um, to, they enroll via email. They com complete initial questionnaires. Um, they get a weekly call from a Choose Health LA Moms health educator until delivery happens. And then after delivery, the program begins where they get every other day text messages along those three campaign themes that I mentioned, breastfeeding, water, and um, 10,000 steps. And they also do, the participants do monthly self-assessments and track their weight um, for a period of six months. And then the program itself um, goes on for one year. And they also will drive participants to social media and websites for more information. And this is a brand new program that's just starting out. So uh, there are no evaluation findings yet, but it has a lot of promise. And there's a contact email here, but there's another one that I can also give you later on at the end of the webinar and a listserv that people can sign up to be part of if they're interested in hearing more. Um, and then the last thing I'll tell you just to get you thinking about a different strategy is about our Food to Families project, which was funded by the Kresge Foundation. It ended a couple of years ago. But this was a different approach to changing the physical environment, the food access environment in low-income communities. Um, and it, the way we came about this is this concept that we use here of flipping the question. So instead of saying, how can we teach people to eat more healthful meals, we ask, what policies and practices will increase the availability of food stores in West Oakland? And you can see from this graph that the number of food stores has gone down precipitously, precipitously over the last 50 years. That's due primarily to a big freeway that was built in that neighborhood and a lot of um, uh, you know, people were forced to leave that community. Um, it's a, a neighborhood with a lot of blight and um, not a lot of economic opportunity. And as a result, businesses just moved out. So now where most people get food is are, um, at places like uh, liquor stores, which I'll show you a picture of in a second. But this GIS map shows you that there, it's, it's a map of limited supermarket access scores. Uh, so the darker areas that you see are places where you have to travel a lot further to get to a supermarket. Um, so along the I-80 corridor, which is the big freeway in, um, in Alameda County, the area, it's, that's where you see the higher scores. That's where the lower income communities of color are and where there are fewer food stores. So most people end up getting food at places like liquor stores, um, and there are just no supermarkets in these neighborhoods. So what we did is we came up with this idea to work with our um, clinics to provide prescriptions to, for fresh food to families, pregnant women and families who are receiving health services at the clinics. And those prescriptions could then be redeemed at local food businesses. It took a lot of work to, develop, to build this infrastructure. But locally owned food businesses where neighborhood youth were employed, the reason that we, we involved the youth is that we heard through needs assessment that there are a lot of youth in the community that were just hanging out, getting into trouble, and needed something to do. So they were employed by, in one community, a, a local urban farm where they learned to 
grow vegetables and harvest the vegetables and deliver them to the women with prescriptions in, in a CSA box to their home. And in the other community in West Oakland, um, we partnered with, um, there's one grocery store that's really trying to make a go of it there, an organic co-op. We partnered with them and youth in the community to deliver um, fresh fruits and vegetables via bicycle to um, liquor stores in the neighborhood. So the liquor stores were actually trying to stock um, produce so that there could be better access for folks at those places that they were already accustomed to shopping in. So those are the things I wanted to tell you about today, and I look forward to some question and answer after the last presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Kiko. That's, it's just so exciting, the work that you're doing um, out in your part of the world. And I'm hoping that folks will continue to chat some questions and comments um, for Kiko as well. So we're moving to our last presenter. So I'm happy to introduce Adeline Yerkes. She serves as a women's health consultant to the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors. And she's working on projects related to maternal child health program directors and chronic disease directors collaboration. So kind of bringing our two groups together, as well as the Gestational Diabetes Quality Improvement Project. Um, she was appointed to the Oklahoma Commission on the Status of Women, where she served as the commission chairperson and the 2012 summit chair for Wise Choices, Solutions for Obesity and Diabetes in Women. Um, Ms. Yerkes graduated from the University of Nebraska with a degree in nursing sciences, and she received a master's degree from University of Omaha in education um, with an emphasis on counseling and guidance, um, and she received a master's degree in public health from the University of Oklahoma. So it's all yours. Thank you very much, Sarah. And welcome, everyone, to this webinar. Can <clears throat> I want to welcome you from the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors, as well as our other partners, the Association of Maternal Child Health Programs, and from the Preconception Initiative. And so I'm kind of ending the uh, speaker group by pulling together a group of resources that I thought would be useful for those of you um, both in program planning as well as maybe some resources for yourself or, or if you are a practitioner, what kinds of resources that you might be able to use. What I did was uh, look at resources that are free. I mean, this is only some of them. Uh, we could probably sit uh, for an hour and a half or two hours and talk about all the resources that are out uh, there and available uh, to the population on obesity prevention. What I'd like to do is primarily show with you uh, those types of things for the program manager or a healthcare provider. Uh, then also, if you're a true practitioner, how you might use some of these resources with your patients. And then third, what kinds of resources might you use yourself? And some of these will relate to all three uh, and some of them more specific. First, I want to talk a little bit about resources for program managing. The first uh, few slides are from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and this particular slide shows you my family, my workplace, and my community, but it gives you strategies on how to uh, increase physical activity, and it's primarily uh, for community planners, but it also helps them to relate to those people in how we work, play, and uh, live. This slide uh, re uh, relates to the obesity prevention strategies on how to increase physical activity. Uh, it shows 10 different strategies in this um, manual, and these um, strategies are all on kind of community-based programs, uh, like community-wide campaigns, appointed decision prompts, uh, how to individualize uh, adapt and adapt uh, health behavior in change programs, how to enhance school programs in physical activity, how to create or enhance access to place for physical activity combined with information outreach, uh, street uh, scale urban design and use design policies, community-based urban design and land use policies, active transportation to school, active transportation and policy related to the general population. So you can see that this particular uh, strategy guide manual uh, addresses kind of, again, how we work, how we play, uh, and where we live. 
<clears throat> the next uh, strategy manual is on the consumption of fruits and vegetables. And here again, 10 different strategies on how to uh, increase the use of fruits and vegetables, uh, how to use a food council uh, to improve the food uh, environment in your particular community, how to um, improve the access uh, to retail stores. Here again, how to talk about food deserts and what you might do unique and different uh, to improve food, uh, food desert uh, disparities. Uh, how to expand uh, or work and start with a farm to an institution program or a farm to school program. How to expand farmers markets. And then how to look at uh, how you might work in a community and support agricultural programs uh, in, in all different kinds of settings. What might be uh, good strategies for workplace uh, cafeterias. Um, how to use fruits and vegetables in a meeting instead of uh, donuts and cookies. Uh, how to support and promote community and home gardens. Uh, and so different policies and strategies in the area of a con uh, con con how to consume in fruits and vegetables. Excuse me. <clears throat> Trying to go quickly here. This is on obesity prevention strategies by using breastfeeding. Uh, this has, again, 10 different strategies. Uh, and this goes all the way from looking at whether you want to breastfeed or not, what you need to do during the maternity process, how the professional can help the woman make the right decision, how you can access uh, professional support through a doula or maybe uh, through La Licha League or any of the different various types of breastfeeding support groups, um, how you can breastfeed in your workplace, what do you have to ask for, what are the questions, that type of thing, um, and then uh, breastfeeding as to improving the health and the bonding with the family and the child. Then uh, also there is the CDC resources for schools. There's two different guides, one on school eating. Uh, the other one is on prevention of uh, obesity through primarily physical activity and uh, community activities that might uh, work best for youth and children. The next particular um, resource is the community guide. The community guide uh, provides the practitioner with the evidence or the lack of evidence in how we can work with various different types of interventions. Uh, what, it, what it shows is three different types of interventions, the or provider one-on-one -on -one intervention, the intervention in a community, uh, and uh, then other types of interventions, uh, more in a group setting type of thing. And this uh, website will also provide some things on schools and work sites. And what this primarily does is compare the evidence to effectiveness. It re looks at the various studies and what studies actually show efficacy, which studies do not. And so shares with you what is the best uh, activities uh, for the bang for your buck in a community, so to speak. Next, I'll switch to the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. They have the, what was just presented at the beginning of our presentation today, the clinical guidelines on the identification, evaluation, and treatment of overweight and obesity in adults. And this gives you the website for that. Trust for America, uh, which is uh, sponsored by Robert Wood Johnson, they have a number of different reports, and it'll show where there's actually been progress made in various activities. This one shows uh, both physical activity and uh, school health programs. This is one on, phys again, physical activity and diet, and then the Well Woman uh, program across or the uh, United States. The Institute of Medicine provides us with a number of reports uh, talking about the progress that we've made in either addressing and making progress on obesity and what are some of the barriers and issues of why we have not made progress uh, and then how to actually accelerate that prog progress. 
Now I want to switch to more of the practitioner uh, type of resource or a resource that you might use as an individual. From here again from CDC, we have the weight uh, assessment uh, and healthy weight website, and this gives all kinds of information about how you ex assess your weight, uh, what, how you would then, once you've made that assessment, uh, how you might make some changes. Um, and then there's the adult widget, which is also a personal website where that person can go in and do the BMI calculation and do some further assessment. National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute has the program called Aim for Your Healthy Weight. Uh, this also has a, a mechanism for doing BMI calculation as well as uh, how you might, with some tips on how you can improve your health and your weight. They also have the Weekend program. This program, Healthy Weight, is primarily uh, related to adults, whereas Weekend is primarily related, related to the child from the ages of two to five. It is the First Lady's initiative that was started uh, prior to First Lady Ob uh, Michelle Obama and uh, has been taken on as her one of her special projects. This focuses on uh, movement and reducing screen time and then eating right uh, to start early good habits for health, healthy weight. The National Institute for Diabetes, uh, Digestive Disease, and Kidney Disease has the Weight Control Information Network, or WIN. Uh, and this is all uh, about helping the very overweight person, how they can be physically active at, at all different sizes. Uh, it has uh, information for the general public. There's information for healthcare providers as well as for community groups, and it also comes in Spanish. The USDA has a number of different tools. Many of us are uh, familiar with MyPlate. Uh, and then they also have the Super Tracker. Uh, the Super Tracker is the actual kind of website, and here they uh, have you track your foods and physical activity. There's also the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, uh, and this is where we go for our evidence-based guidelines uh, to help us uh, work with the uh, American population. And then they also have a website for recipes, and I looked at a number of the di uh, different recipes. Many of them are uh, recipes that uh, can be used uh, for all different um, socioeconomic groups. They have some for even some uh, particular um, items around a low income. The Million Hearts Campaign is a DHHS um, national um, program, and they have a, a site for uh, recipes, and then they also have a site for uh, resources, uh, and, and primarily resources for employers, how to bring cardiovascular health for their employees. But this is all about improving heart, um, heart health and focusing on reducing heart attacks and stroke. Uh, DHHS also has uh, three steps. I mean, we've kind of talked about this. Uh, uh, Dr. Millen talked about it. Dr. Meadows talked about it. And uh, Kiko actually demonstrated how we uh, talk to our clients uh, about uh, weight management. And so it's the three different steps. Um, and talks primarily about interviewing tools. The Office on Women's Health in Indian Health Service has the Body Works. Uh, but there's a general body works, and then there is a special body works for the American Indian population. This is uh, primarily for young girls, and um, but it also works very well with teens. I've been working with several different groups with this, and uh, it's worked well with a range of girls from about uh, eight or nine all the way up to uh, about 14 or 15. The American Heart Association has a fat calculator and then has a center for healthy living tips and, and tools. American Diabetes Association has one on weight loss. Here again, an assessment tool, a, a food calculator, exercise calculators, talking about setting realistic goals, food choice. The Arthritis Foundation has uh, benefits to losing weight and uh, how to lose weight along, because of your 
arthritic pounds, uh, arthritic pain, and how to lose weight, and what are the weight uh, challenges when you do have a lot of pain. And then there are various different state programs. Uh, and if you'll just look on your own state website, I just put up three just uh, to, as, as a demonstration. North Carolina's Eat Smart, Move More, uh, California's Project Lean, uh, Utah's Making the Healthy Choice. On the Utah website, they actually have a locator, uh, and you can actually put in your uh, community and your county, and it pulls up a number of resources. And then there's the National Achieve Program, which is a program uh, that is a funded by um, not only the Robert Wood Johnson, but the CDC, uh, and it talks about um, how you can work from the bottom up in a community and change policies in communities uh, to make uh, a more healthy community. I know I've gone through these Thank very rapidly. We have put together a um, PDF file that you can download on the various different resources uh, for your uh, convenience. Again, thank you so much for spending the time with us today, and I'll hand it back to Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our speakers. Um, certainly there is um, no excuse for any of us to at least not be able to understand there are tons of resources out there for us to access. Um, I had no idea how many until um, we had a chance to hear about all those great resources. So hopefully you all can explore some of those and um, look at using them in your practice. Um, and I'm not going to spend time talking about these other resources, but they are available in the slide set. These are some resources about the National Preconception Health and Health Care Initiative for those of you that may be um, chronic disease partners who may not know as much about our work. Um, there's a lot of different information available um, at the end of the slides for you to connect to. Um, so we want to make sure that we have time to answer a few questions. Um, one note to Kiko, I think that there might have been an email bounce back from someone who was trying to access the LA Moms project. Okay. So the, the, um, it looks like it should be la moms at ph.lacounty.gov. So I'm not sure how that bounced, but just wanted to pull that yeah. to your attention. Okay, thanks, Sarah. I'll look into mm -hmm. it. And then um, Shelley um, Lanigan highlighted that it might be good to reinstate the presidential fitness awards that were given to school age kids and also make physical education required subject um, through school years 1st through 12th. So that's a good suggestion. I'm thinking about the health of our our um, our kids. Um, looking at some other questions that came through. Um, so we did have a question um, as during the first presentation about kind of factoring the cost of factoring in the cost of losing weight. And I'm hopeful that some of our other speakers were able to address that. And also, it um, does seem that we do have resources nationally that um, are beginning to really pay attention to. Um, being mindful of the expense and, and, and importance of having availability of affordable fruits and vegetables. Um, and um, are there any resources related to food marketing to children and its effect on childhood obesity? So I wanted to put that question out there. Um, um, I could say that the Institute of Medicine has a report on that very subject. Great. So would they just need to Google Institute of Medicine? Yeah, if you go to the Institute of Medicine, you can see the report um, that they've done, I think two years ago, on marketing to children and the effect it has on their decision making, both in um, promoting a sedentary lifestyle as well as increasing their consumption of high calorie, high sugar foods. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I think it was, uh, the report was done in April of 13. I showed it in one of the slides. Mm -hmm. It was educating the student body, and I think that report had a lot of that type of information in it. It is on one of the slides. Great. From the Institute of Medicine. Great. Um, and then Second, I also pointed out that there's a good documentary called Consuming Kids, which is available free on YouTube. 
um, and I will say that my daughter watched a documentary in one of her classes. I think it was the one where the guy just ate at McDonald's for a while. And I will say that it's now been four years, and that child will not go to McDonald's. So there's some <laughs> there's some good um, documentaries out there too. Um, we also had a couple of questions for our first speaker, and I think the um, the first one was to please ask. Uh, state the location of the guideline that that you reviewed again. The question was it was it NHLBI? Yes, um, NHLBI, National, okay, great. Um, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Great. Um, and it does seem like there's quite a few res resources available there. And then I think you can see also there's were a couple of other questions about the um, Health Main website. Yes. Um, about the educational level, literacy level, culturally appropriate. Um, and it looks like there are some other great resources that are uh, culturally appropriate, but what about that one particular website that you Yeah, mentioned? that's that's a really important and a good question. And um, it, we did a lot of uh, research with clinicians and consumers, but all of the tools that are used for the lifestyle risk assessment and the creation of that personalized lifestyle profile um, were drawn um, not only from our uh, research at Framingham, which is in a, um, uh, it, it, for those who may not know, a community that was a typical American community with a population demographic of uh, blue collar or, or less. And the instruments have been used broadly in large, you know, cross sections of the population and are supplemented by um, tools from um, the health interview survey um, and others that are, again, tested for use in a broad demographic. Um, certainly there are, there are uh, resources that are more advanced. But the the um, you know this is where partnering with the um, clinician and um, the healthcare provider is is important. Great, thank you. Um, and we are at time, and I'm going to turn over to Am in one second. But I just wondered, Kiko, real quick, do you have just a basic kind of costs associated with operating off Club Mom? Um, yeah, well, it's part of a big grant that we have through Healthy Start. But essentially, um, I think. We, we try to get some donations, but basically to buy the food and the incentives and things, it can cost a, a couple of hundred dollars to do a series of them. So it's not cheap, but there are ways to make it a little less expensive. So that's just a couple of hundred dollars as opposed mm -hmm. to a couple of thousand dollars. Yeah. So yeah. it sounds like it's <laughs> actually it's a, it is a pretty uh, cost-effective program. Well, thank you again to all of our speakers. And Megan, I'll let you just take it, finish it up. Excellent. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you all so much for joining us on this webinar today. And again, thank you to all of our speakers for your willingness to share your expertise. We hope you all found this information to be valuable. Again, the webinar was recorded, and the link to the recording and the speaker's slide should be posted to the AMSHIP, web AMSHIP website shortly, as well as beforeandbeyond.org in the news section. Um, Please also take a moment to complete the brief survey that will be emailed to you after the webinar ends to help us inform future learning events. Um, thank you again and have a great rest of your day. Operator, you may now end the webinar. Thank you.